In the domain of semiotics, but also in the neighboring disciplines, the name of Yuri Lotman evokes a plethora of concepts, such as text, culture, semiosphere, explosion, to mention but a few. Lotman's centenary is a unique opportunity to rethink his legacy to the 21st century and to contextualize his thought. It is also a chance to deepen and discuss the constellation of his ideas and to track the ramifications that his work has opened up and inspired throughout his life. Lotman had many qualities, but one was remarkable, namely a sort of diagonal thinking, as it were. This quality equipped him with a proclivity to cross uh, disciplinary boundaries and to dialogue with the hard sciences. The semiosphere is a case in point, because it illustrates a fruitful dialogue between different fields, such as biogeochemistry and the humanistic disciplines. Indeed, Lotman paid tribute to Vernadsky, and the concept of the semiosphere was modeled in analogy with Vernadsky's biosphere. Today, the widespread use of digital media, the rise of the internet culture, and even the experience of a global epidemic make us aware of the fact that Lotman's vision was far-sighted. Perhaps we have not yet fully grasped nor sufficiently capitalized on his perspective, despite the popularity that the concept of the semiosphere has gained in recent years. 38 years have passed since the publication of Lotman's Pivotal article, and since then the contemporary se semiosphere has grown. Whilst in the 1980s it comprised radio satellites, the verses of the poets and the cries of animals, today the semiosphere encompasses fast internet, web conferencing, coronavirus, artificial intelligence, and even virtual worlds like the metaverse. Rethinking Lotman's ideas in this precise historical moment takes on a very special meaning. This is so because we live in a time of tremendous uncertainty, confusion and crisis. Lotman himself would define these particular moments as epochs of transition in which the old lords are all travelled and the new ones have yet to open. For this reason, rethinking Lotman's ideas now is pivotal. If it is true that the most important ideas come in moments of catastrophe and crisis, as Vyacheslav Ivanov wrote, let this be the motto and the wish accompanying all those who are rethinking Lotman's ideas in today's world. May this lead us to deepen in the least charted waters of contemporary semiotics. In this presentation I will be dealing with the concept of semiosphere and more precisely I will discuss one particular aspect of this model, namely the mechanism of mirror reflection thought of as a property of text generation as well as an attribute of the structural organization of a semiosphere. Let us go immediately in medias res by quoting Lotman's own article. Just as a face that is wholly reflected in a mirror is also reflected in each one of the mirror's fragments, which thus are both a part of and the likeness of the intact mirror, in an integral semiotic mechanism, a particular text is isomorphous, in certain respect, with the entire textual, textual world, and a distinct parallelism exists among individual consciousness, the text, and the culture as a whole. Lotman uh, mentions the Czech religious writer of the 14th century, Thomas Stitney, and gives the analogy of a face in a mirror to convey the idea of sameness and difference and the relation of the parts to the whole. The idea of mirror reflections, asymmetry and isomorphism are thus key 
to the structure of the semiosphere, hence the title of my presentation, Oblique Semiotics, Reflections in the Semiosphere, which, perhaps, it may uh, not be straightforward. Oblique semiotics is a terminology which I borrow from Gray Mass in connection with the formulation of the square of veridiction. In this context, however, I will be using the term oblique semiotics in its literal meaning, for it refers to the mirror image mechanism and to mirror reflections that are intrinsic to the structure of the semiosphere and make up as well the essence of a semiotical understanding of dialogue. Mirrors are powerful symbols and have a long pedigree. Magical and enigmatic, mirrors have been a source of fascination to the arts and mythology, from the legend of Narcissus, whose image was reflected into the water, to the Greek myth of Medusa and Perseus. The interpretation of mirrors, however, is not always clear and it presents many challenges to the researcher. The properties of mirror were known to the Greeks, Plato describes it in his dialogue Timaeus, and Lucretius in ancient Rome devotes an entire chapter to mirrors in De Rerum Natura, where he discusses the nature of simulacra. Likewise, Augustine discusses mirrors in tandem with the issue of identity and likeness, and conceives of mirror reflections as a special type of resemblance between things that are not equal but are inferior one in respect to the other. These are the representation of an object, and although there is a degree of likeness between the object and the thing represented, they are not identical. Mirrors have many functions. First of all, mirrors and the self-perception of the human face are intertwined. Whilst it is visible to others, unless it is masked or disguised, the face is invisible to the subject. As the anthropologist Tim Ingold uh, pointed out, as a surface, the face has some very peculiar properties. I can feel my own face and others can see it, but it remains invisible to me. Where others see my face, I see the world. Here lies, according to Umberto Eco, the magic of mirrors, because the mirror not only allows us to look closer at the world, but also to look at ourselves as others see us. Moreover, Mirrors are prostheses, like dentures or a telescope, and as such, they extend the array of action of an organ. As Umberto Eco pointed out, this is achieved mainly in two ways. Firstly, by a magnifying function, as in the example of a lens, and secondly, by a reduction function, as in the case of a pair of pincers, where you can extend the ability to grab something, but the tactile and the thermic sensations of the fingers are somewhat hampered. Mirrors also can be used both for protection and for the gathering of information. The protective function of mirrors is evident in the Greek legend of Medusa and Perseus, who used a polished shield as a mirror in order to avoid the petrifying staring of Medusa. Illustrations of the second function of mirrors are the one-way mirror and the rear-view mirror, used as information-gathering devices. The significance of mirrors persists today. It suffices to mention the widespread use of mirror-like technology, the selfie, as contemporary digital self-portraits of the subject across media platforms. In contemporary scholarship, mirrors have also been a concern for semioticists, art historians, as well as physicists. Within semiotics, the works of the Tartu Moscow School, not only Yuri Lotman, but also Yuri Levin, and all the members of the group, in Italy, Umberto Eco, Ugo Volli, and Paolo Fabri, as well as Winfred Neuth, 
and Goran Sonneson all made important contributions to the study of this subject. As Lotman pointed out, the problem of the mirror as a semiotic mechanism is posed for the first time with clarity in 1896 by Louise Carroll's Alice in Wonderland. As Alice said, when she peered into the mirror, everything in the room seems to go the other way. Carroll thus pointed out a key property of mirrors, namely their reversal property. The image of ourselves reflected in the mirror is not exactly the same as ourself. If we look carefully, there are some features that are asymmetric. On the mirror twin, all these features are somewhat transposed. If you have a scar on your right eyebrow, the mirror twin has it on the left, and similarly with all the other left-right features. The idea of sameness and difference is pivotal, and it lies at the basis of the structure of the semiosphere as well. Lotman acknowledges the effects of a reversal structure of texts on the human consciousness, as in the example of the Chinese and Russian palindrome, as well as in the esoteric meaning of reversal structure of texts. Not all mirrors, however, have a reversal property, as there are mirrors that do not invert the image reflected. One point of contention has been why mirrors revert only the left and the right properties and do not revert the bottom-up properties of the image reflected. This point has been a matter of disagreement between Lotman and Umberto Eco. Whilst Lotman was keen in considering the reversal property of mirror reflections as essential for the structure of the semiosphere, Umberto Eco, on the contrary, argued that mirrors do not invert at all. Whilst both Eco and Lotman underscored the semiotic significance of mirrors, their interpretations depart. Eco argues that mirrors are not signs and, therefore, they cannot be used in order to lie. Based on observations from the pragmatics of mirrors, that is to say, from the uses of mirrors in everyday life, Echo denies the reversal property of mirrors, namely the swapping of left and right side in mirror reflections. The analysis of the mirror as a phenomenon of the semiotics of culture is quite different and includes an antiomorphism, symmetry and asymmetry as key aspects. The duplication of reality, which allows for the creation of another world similar but not identical to the one reflected in the mirror, is important. In the book Universe of the Mind, the possibility of doubling is the ontological premise for the transformation of the world of objects into the world of signs. Lotman provides, once again, as an example, a face which is reflected in a mirror. He argues that the reflection of the face cannot be touched, as the mirror image is lacking the relations that are natural for the human face in flesh and bones. However, the mirror image can enter into semiotic relations, as for instance, this image can be used to harm one person as it is well illustrated by the example of the Damnatio Memoria, or it can be used in uh, magic. Lotman is very sharp in pointing out a parallel between mirrors and models, or copies, and also between mirrors and imprints, as for instance footprints or fingerprints. The conclusion that Lotman gleaned from the observations of the so-called archaic consciousness is that when a sorcerer performed rituals by using footprints which were left by a man on the ground, he did not distinguish the part from the whole and considered the footprint as identical to the person who produced it. For Lotman, the footprint left on the soil is another example of identity and difference that occurs at one and the same time. It is exactly this property, that of being the same whilst being different, 
like in the example of the footprint that is at one at the same time identified and not identified with the person who produced it which renders this fit to enter into a semiotical situation. The principle of sameness and difference is key. It is the linchpin both of the semiosphere as well as of a semiotical understanding of dialogue. In the midst of his article on the semiosphere, Lotman discusses the relationship between the parts and the whole, within the structure of the semiosphere. Lotman argues that diversity and integrity or unity are two complementary aspects of this model, as one presupposes the other. He uses several metaphors to convey this point. Lotman writes, indeed, that the parts enter into the whole not as a part of a piece of machinery, but as organs in the body. This means that, for Lotman, within the semiosphere, each of its parts is itself a whole, closed and structurally self-sufficient unto itself. Lotman accounts for the relations of the parts to the whole by means of the concepts of isomorphism. It is at this juncture that Lotman draws on the analogy of a face reflected in a mirror that we discussed above. As a face is reflected in a mirror as a whole, and it is also reflected in each of the mirror's fragments, these are both parts of the mirror as well as its likeness. By analogy, a single text is isomorphous to the entire textual world. Lotman points out that in relation to the whole, the parts exhibit the property of isomorphism, since they are in other levels in the structural hierarchy. Thus, they are a part of the whole and its likeness, at one and the same time. And yet, how does isomorphism operate within the semiosphere? Isomorphism can be of different sorts. One type, termed as vertical isomorphism, operates at the quantitative level, as it increases the amount of texts in the semiosphere. Vertical isomorphism exists between structures which are situated at different levels of the hierarchy in the semiosphere. This explains the quantitative growth of messages within the semiosphere by means of a replication system, by means of replicas. Once again, Lotman uses the mirror analogy in order to convey this point. I quote, Just as an object reflected in a mirror generates hundreds of reflections in the fragments of the mirror, a message introduced into an integral semiotic structure is multiplied in many copies at lower levels. The system is capable of transforming a text into an avalanche of texts. Different is the case of the elaboration of novelty, of the creation of new texts. To address this point, Lotman draws on another type of isomorphism which remains unnamed. In this case, the substructures participating in it must be not isomorphous to one another, but they are isomorphous to a third element on a higher level of which system it is a part. The illustration given is the natural language and the iconic language of painted pictures that are not isomorphous to one another, but each of them is, in different respects, isomorphous with the non-semiotic world of reality, of which they are a representation in some language. If we go even on a deeper level, the mirror mechanism permeates the semiosphere as Lotman conceives of it as one of the key ingredients of dialogue, as well as a universal principle that cuts across a multiplicity of levels, from the molecular level to a higher level of culture, through the opposition of symmetry and asymmetry. As for the first point, dialogue, 
identity and difference are listed by Lotman among the key fe features of dialogue, which are coupled with the following characteristics. First of all, reciprocity and the idea of interchangeability of the time of emission and the time of reception of a message within a dialogue. Secondly, the idea of discreteness. And thirdly, the possibility of translation. Lotman concludes, importantly, that dialogue precedes language and, likewise, the semiosphere is the prerequisite for any language and any semiotic system to be able to operate. As for the second point, asymmetry is taken as a universal structural property that cuts across different phenomena, from the molecular level to the level of culture. For Lotman, the simplest form of mirror asymmetry is enantiomorphism, which is regarded as a general principle which is found in different levels of the semiosphere. Also in this respect, Lotman pays tribute to Vernaski, who, in turn, drew on the so-called Pasteur-Curie principle of asymmetry. This idea resurfaces on many occasions as Lotman diagonally connects all the dots forming its trajectory. It can be found in the way the human brain operates in reading texts in a reversal mode, which affects the human consciousness. It can be found at the semantic level of texts through the topos of the double, at the level of plots, as well as in the organization of space, as for instance in Dante's Inferno as well as in the modes of production of esoteric texts such as magic formula or secret messages. In light of what has been said so far, this proves that Lotman exercised with dexterity the quality of diagonal thinking evoked in the introduction. He drew a constellation of ideas that, although different, show a certain unity and weighed them together in a coherent whole. The principle of mirror reflection, as I showed in this presentation, is a good illustration of this point. Thank you.